Uh, good morning, good morning. Um, so, uh, how many cat lovers do we have in, in the room today? All right, we got a, we got a few. I know it's a, you don't want to raise them too high. <laughs> uh, how many dog lovers do we have? Do you have? A, all right, yeah, that's great. I, I think this is a great way to, to start a sermon to really create division amongst the church inside. We're <laughs> like, oh, you're the you're the cat lover. But um, uh, I've always loved dogs. I, I, and uh, growing up, uh, we always had stray dogs, and, and uh, of course, I would take care of them. But in, they never really felt like they were my dog. It just felt like someone else's dog that I was taking care of. And so. Uh, growing up, when I had all these stray dogs, it just felt like not mine until this dog came along, and her name was Chiquita. Chiquita was this little black lab, and uh, we found her along the, the side of, in the foothills with a, in a box with a, two, other, two other dogs. So it was a small little puppy litter. And uh, their tails had been cut off or they're snipped or whatever. And so they were kind of emotionally messed up. I mean, the, the, the two other dogs were like, a, um, you know, semi-aggressive. They're just wild beasts. And Chiquita was the exact opposite. My little Chiquita, she was, a, she was just a girl who uh, hid in corners, like didn't like hit under tables, hid under everything she could find, peed every time you would show any type of affection to her, which I can definitely relate to. Um, she was just afraid of everything. Like she was this poor little pup, which just afraid of everything, uh, but I took her home, and, and I loved her as much as I could, you know, just trying to nurse her to, like, say, hey, it's okay, little baby girl, but eventually, after months and months and months, after the slow, slow process, she eventually became just a really, really sweet dog. She came out of her shell. She stopped coming, and, I mean, stopped hiding in corners, stopped hiding under her table, stopped peeing everywhere, and, and eventually, you know, she would approach me, and she would wag her little nub tail, and it was so cute, and she would, like, I, I could just take her everywhere, and, and I loved this dog. She was just so amazing. Uh, I could walk with her off leash. She would never leave my side. Like, she was just such a faithful, loving dog. And so one day, uh, Niles came along, and uh, Niles was another stray dog that I happened to come across while riding my bike um, in a random neighborhood. There was this dog. Um, he was like, I don't know what kind of dog he, he was. Like, he was like a miniature Great Dane, if you can imagine that. <laughs> but uh, he, was a, he was a big dog, and uh, his name was Niles. He had a tag on it, and he was with this other dog, this little chihuahua dog. And uh, I was like, well, well I'm not just going to leave them here. They came up to me, and like, they're like wanting something, so like, I, I just can't drive away. I got to do something. So you can, if you can imagine, Stephen, on, on his bike, he picks up this little chihuahua, and then he looks at Niles, and he's like, what do I, how do I get you? So he, I take off my belt, and I wrap it around his collar, and so I'm trying to ride a bike and like walk this huge dog back home to call the owners, because I didn't have a cell phone at the time. It was way back when there weren't cell phones everywhere. And so I had to go back home and call the owners. And, and when I got home, and I looked at Niles' tag, and I, and I called the owners, it was disconnected. The number didn't exist. I was like, okay. It's kind of weird. So I look at the Chihuahua, and it was a different number. And I was like, that's super weird. And so I called that number, and I'm like, hey, I, I think I found your dog. And the owners were super grateful. They're like, oh, my gosh, thank you so much. And I was like, yeah. So uh, we, we, we had the Chihuahua and, and, like, Niles. And they're like, who's Niles? I'm like, it's the other, your other dog. They're like, no. <laughs> like, no, there's two dogs. I was riding my bike. They were together, two dogs. No, we only have one dog. We don't know who this Niles guy is. I was like, all right, so it's really strange. So the next day, I, I take I take him the, their dog, um, and they're super grateful. They're super happy. And I'm like, are you sure this isn't your dog? Like, they're together, two dogs. You guys take them both? They're like, no, that's definitely not our dog. I'm like, okay. So I don't know what to do other than just take him home. So I have Niles at my house. I have him hanging out with me, and everything was pretty good for a couple of weeks. Niles and Chiquita got along fine. He was a pretty good dog. Uh, again, like I said, for the first couple of weeks. But then after that, he started to do something. When we would open the door, when we would open the gate, he would go one house down. And we'd call him back and he'd come running and we're like, okay, it's so weird. And so the next day, he would go two houses down. Like, come back now, stay over here, you got it good. <laughs> And so we would do this, and, and over a couple weeks, it, it was, again, go to three houses, four houses, then he was down the block, and then he was down the street, and every time he'd come back. But then another thing started to happen. Chiquita started to follow him. This girl that would never leave my side, this girl who I thought, you know, had it pretty good, wouldn't leave, and then she started to take a couple of steps. And then it was a house, and then it was two houses. And then one night... Unfortunately, the, the, the gate was left open, and then we woke up the next morning, and both dogs were gone. They had run off. 
And I, and I imagine in my head, you know, Niles had this like thought of like, okay, yeah, it's, it's pretty good here, but I've lived a little bit and I've seen the world and there's probably something better out there for me. And I imagine, you know, Chiquita, I loved her so much, you know, her thinking like, yeah, like I, I kind of love what I have here and it's good here, but what if I'm missing out on something else? And that's why I go one house down, two house down, and eventually I leave. And the reason I share this story is because I think it can easily be our story when it comes to Jesus. And I think this is part of the Colossian story, and this is why Paul's writing this letter to them. That he's pointing back to Jesus over and over and over because he wants us to remember how good we have it. He wants us to remember where our home is. Because what tends to happen is that we tend to forget. We tend to forget who Jesus is, what he's done, and where he's taking us. And when we forget, we will eventually drift away. And it happens slowly that we think things like, sure, I have Jesus, but what if there's something more? Sure, I have Jesus, but I have my hopes and my dreams. I want to be something. I want to do something. How do I get that? Sure, I have Jesus, but isn't there something better we forget that Jesus is supreme over creation, that there's nothing higher than him. We forget that Jesus is sufficient over all, that there's nothing except, nothing except him that will make us feel good or righteous or whole. And when we continue down this road of forgetting and drifting and forgetting and drifting, eventually we'll leave. And I think this is why in the first chapter of Colossians, Paul is like pouring out and laying out this argument that it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Look at how grand he is. Look at how great he is. Look at how supreme he is. That Jesus is supreme because he's sufficient and he's sufficient because he's supreme. That there's nothing higher than him in all creation because he created everything. Invisible and invisible on heaven and on earth. He holds all things together. He is before all things. And when it comes to making everything right, everything and everyone will go through him. And it's by trusting in his, in his work of dying and rising from the dead that his enemies become holy and blameless. In fact, this morning, we're going to finally get to Paul's first command to these Colossians. You know, he's laying out this case of how great Jesus is, and then he finally he gets to this truth. He finally gets to this commandment after laying out these truths that Jesus is supreme, and he's sufficient, and he's supreme because he's sufficient, and he's sufficient because he's supreme. He finally gets his command. He says, this is what we ought to do. He starts it off by saying, so then... Because we know this about Jesus, because he's supreme over all, because he's sufficient over all, so then you should do something. And he continues, so then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. And this is the thing that I think is so unique about being a Jesus follower. This is the thing that I think is so unique than any other worldview, than any other religion when it comes down to Christianity. Because think about it like this. When you think about work, when you think about your career, you feel like, okay, once I get to a certain spot, the only next thing to do is to aim for that next promotion. To aim for that next thing. To move on from where I'm at and move up. To move on to something different. Or even when we think about philosophies, when we think about, oh, okay, now that I've mastered this precept, the only thing that I'm left to do is move on to something else. Because I've mastered this, so now I've got to move on to this one. And once I've mastered this one, I'm going to move on to the next one. Or even in just life, that we feel like, okay, now that I'm, I'm not a kid anymore, and I'm not a teenager anymore, and now i got to start adulting, what does that look like? How much more do I have to take on my plate? Now that I've graduated from this elementary idea, I can move on to something bigger and better and be more adult-like. But with Christianity, it's so different than that. Because in Christianity, if you want to grow... If you want to move to the next level, it's not done by moving to the next thing. 
If you want to grow in Christ, you don't move away from Christ, but you dive deeper into him, which is so radical. There's no moving on from Jesus. It's the thing that we're going to go back to over and over and over and over. You don't, if you want to grow in Christ, you don't move away from him, but you dive deeper into him. Now, this is why, you know, when we look at Jesus, we're, we're supposed to cling to him. We're supposed to be rooted in him, dig into him, lean on him, build your life up in him. Because for the Jesus follower, the call is always going to be the same. To go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, and go back to Jesus. And if Paul is laying out this argument of going back to Jesus, going back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, the first question that comes to mind is like, why is he laying out this case? And I think for me, it's like that idea of like, okay, if we're being called back to something, that means we're moving away from it. That we've moved in a direction that's further and further away, so he's calling us back. And so the question that I have for us this morning is, where is it that we go? Where is it that we go that we have to be called back to? Again, Paul is laying out this case that Jesus is supreme because he's fully sufficient. And he's fully sufficient, which makes him supreme. So go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus. And the reason we leave Jesus is because we can be tempted to forget him. And when we forget, we drift. And if we drift, we might leave. So think about this question. What is it that we go to? What is it that we lean on? What is it that we build our lives on? Because I think this is true for all of us. And, and, and it can't just me be me. I can't be the only one who thinks this. But sometimes when I pray, and when my prayers go unanswered, what do you do? Because for me, when my prayers go unanswered, I start to question everything. I start to question God. I'm like, God, are, are you listening right now? Like, do you even care? Do you even exist? Because I'm struggling here and I'm pouring my heart out and things aren't changing. Or when I pray for change, but that change comes very, very slowly or very, very little, it's like I'm tempted to take matters in my own hands and say, okay, thanks God for the little encouragement. I can take it from here. Or God, you're not moving fast enough. I've got to do something right now because right now is intense and I need some relief from that. So what will I go to? And sometimes, this is what I'm really guilty of, is that sometimes I'm guilty of living a life like, yeah, I have Jesus but Jesus just isn't enough. Sometimes I struggle with that. Like I, I live this life of saying like, yeah, okay, I have Jesus, but what's that next thing? What's that thing that I need to add on my plate to really do something? Because again, we have hopes and we have dreams and we want to be somebody and we want to do something. Yeah, we have Jesus, but how do we get to that level? It's like I live this life, but Jesus just isn't enough. That I have this life, but instead of diving deeper into Jesus, I just hold him onto the side. And I opt out of just Jesus, and I opt in for this Jesus Plus program. I, yeah, I got Jesus, but what else is it that I need to feel whole, to feel good, to feel like I'm satisfied? Again, this question is the same for us. What is it that we will go to? What will we go to? If we need to be called back to Jesus... Where are we going to? And Paul's saying, go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus. And in verse 8, he continues, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, rather than on Christ. And so he's, he has this structure. He has this, you know, this question that we might have is like, okay, so yeah, wh why should we go to Jesus, Paul? And Paul says, because he rules over everything. Everything in heaven and in earth, invisible and invisible. He rules over it. He rules over creation. He rules over redemption. He is fully supreme and fully sufficient. Why dive deeper into him, though? Why, do we, why should we cling to him? And Paul's like, didn't, didn't you just hear me? Because he is the best thing for you. There's nothing else better. And you need to go to him because this is why you will be tempted to leave him. You need to cling to him because you will be tempted and pulled away from him. How? By hollow and deceptive philosophies, by human traditions or values, or just looking at created things and worshiping those things instead of the creator of those things. And I know I do this all the time over and over. I look at philosophies or traditions or values or just created things and I'll hold those really tight and leave Jesus off to the side. 
You know, the Colossians at the time were facing a lot of Gnosticism, where they were from, this idea that uh, Gnostics had this idea that uh, God, you know, didn't interact with his creation, but he used uh, spirits or they used angels to like do his work. And sometimes the, 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 uh, the temptation there was to say, okay, these spirits or these angels will worship those things because they seem to be doing all the work. And Gnostics also had this idea that um, God didn't like uh, natu- like um, interact with the material, so he was just way far out there. And so they're dealing with that, but then they also had these ideas that, um, you know, Greek philosophy was inside of their culture. So they're struggling with those ideas, and like they sound good, and also uh, Jewish uh, mysticism. So they had all these things up against them, and they're like figuring out, okay, like how do we filter through all this? Because the struggle was like all those things aren't inherently sinful. None of those things were actually really, really bad. We're like, okay, you're, you're calling me to, to do all this stuff, but that's really, really bad. No, it's like, okay, I can see where you're coming from. Some of this stuff is good. Some of this stuff sounds wise. Some of this st- stuff sounds like, okay, you know what you're talking about. And I think that was the danger because there wasn't any like immediate danger. The danger of falling into these philosophies, the danger of falling into these teachings or ideas was that it didn't seem that bad. And I think for us, we can relate to the Church of Colossae in so many ways because of that. Because in our culture, how many great things do we have? How many good things are there that we get to take advantage of? And there are tons of them. And I think the danger comes that sometimes when we look at those great things, when we look at those good things, we almost turn a blind eye when it comes to those great things and we turn them into ultimate things. Where we ultimately make them our idols. And when I was looking over this text of, you know, you know, what is it that, that those, what are those hollow philosophies? What are those deceptive things? What, what are those things that, that he's talking about? Like, what does that look like for me? I already started formulating a list in my head of like the things that I was taken captive by. Again, when I was looking at the, the hollow philosophies, the human traditions or values, the created things, I started to formulate this, this list and, and, and they weren't like things that were bad but they had captivated me, and they were pulling me away from Jesus. And the first thing that I thought of was freedom. That this idea of freedom, sometimes I have in my head that it's like, freedom is the the ability to do whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anybody. And maybe you've said this, or maybe you've heard someone say this, that, yeah, freedom is a really, really good thing as long as you're not hurting anybody. But freedom is way more complex than just doing whatever you want as long as you're not hurting anybody. Because you bring God into the picture, and it changes everything. It changes all of it. Freedom isn't doing whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, as long as you're not hurting anybody. That's not what freedom is. Freedom is this. Freedom is to align yourself with how you've been designed because there is a designer. And that's when you find true freedom. And this is what I mean. So you, you look at a fish and you say, okay, this fish, I, I'm going to free him up of all the constraints of his world. I'm going to take him out of water so that he can truly be free, that he can do whatever he wants, however he wants. And when you, what you find is that when you take that fish out of water— it starts to die. It doesn't thrive. He doesn't experience freedom. He actually experiences something that we call suffocation. Is it suffocation? <laughs> I always forget that word. You see, the fish was designed to be in water. And only when it's aligned with its design does it experience true freedom. And I think it's the same for us. That we experience true freedom when we align ourselves with the Creator. With how we've been designed. And the second thing that I thought of in this list for me was comfort. That I just want to do whatever I need to do to make myself feel comfortable. If it's obtaining more things or, or maybe it's just avoiding things. Like I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid that person. I'm going to avoid this conversation. I'm going to ignore the wrongs that have happened to me just to feel like there's some peace in the room because I'm a huge peacemaker. Or, may, or this, again, that idea of like I just need to obtain, uh, obtain more things and I need to hold on to them while they're here. And maybe you can relate to that. Or maybe you're on the other side. You're just like, okay, the things that I want— are more me time. I just want, the, the thing that I need to feel at peace, the thing, that, the thing that I need to feel comfortable is just more me time. And maybe that means you just need more screen time or you need more golf time or sports time or gossip time. You want to feel a part of a community and so you do all these things. 
Or maybe it's the idea that we put something or anything that puts this world as our primary concern. Do you put this world as your primary concern? And maybe this world is, is too broad of a thing because when we say this world, we think, I think of like the whole globe. But if we made that our primary concern, I'm sure we would do a lot of better things. But I think what we mean when we say this world, we mean our little bubble, our little area, the things that concern us primarily. When we make those our primary concerns, when we make us our primary concerns, we might be tempted to drift away from Jesus because we've forgotten about him. We've made all these other things more important than him. We've opted for that Jesus Plus program. Yeah, I have Jesus, but I need that me time. Yeah, I have Jesus, but I need more stuff. Yeah, I have Jesus, but this makes me feel whatever you need to feel. So the question that I've been asking myself it's like, how do I know that I'm being tempted? How do I know that I'm being taken away from Jesus? How do I know that I'm drifting? And I think that question goes to you. What do you how do you know? How do you know when you're in that space? How do you know that you need to be called back to Jesus? How do you know that you're being tempted or drifted away? And so I thought of these questions for myself. And the first question was, where am I with Jesus? It's the same question that Paul's asking them. It's like, go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, because you are drifting, you are forgetting, you are doing all those things, and you will be tempted to leave. So this question of where are we with Jesus? Are we just saying, yeah, we have Jesus, but I'm also facing this way? That Jesus is to my back? Yeah, I have Jesus, but how close is he to you? How involved are you with him? And the second one is, how am I being discipled, if at all? Are you part of a small group? Are you part of, are you, do you meet with somebody weekly, daily? Do you give somebody a call? Are you inside of your Bible? Like, what does that look like? How are you being discipled? How are you connecting to the source of life? And this is a big one for me. The, the, the struggle is, man, could I put social media away? Am I tapping more into that? than God. How, how Could I put that away? Could I look at Facebook or Instagram or TV or those leisurely activities? Could I put those aside for a month and not do them, not tap into them? And if, if, if I couldn't, like would I feel pain if I did? Would it be a struggle if I did? Because I know for me, putting my phone down for five minutes feels like, a, like torture sometimes. It's just a habit. I'm just like, oh, I got it. Oh, wait, what? I'm not even checking anything. It's just a habit. And sometimes I feel like I'm tapping more into that than anything else. So if you did that for a month, how much pain would you feel? Does your mind drift to tomorrow? Does it drift to a project or work? Do you miss out on the blessing in front of you because you're too busy somewhere else? And again, I, I get it. I'm, I'm right there with you because I'm struggling with this stuff. I'm drifting and I'm forgetting. I have to be called back to Jesus, called back to Jesus, called back to Jesus. And, and a lot of this stuff comes, comes to mind when I think about my kids. You know, I, I want something better for my kids. I, I want them to experience something more. I, want to, I don't want them to suffer any pain, really. I don't want them to be uncomfortable. I don't want them to go without. I want them to have a better uh, experience than I had. I want them to have all these things. But in trying to show them all these good things, I'm just showing them stuff. I'm just showing them other things than Jesus. And when I do that, I, I'm saying, listen, if you want to be happy, if you want to be comfortable, if you want to be made whole, it's found in all these things. And I rarely show them Jesus. I rarely show them that the ultimate thing is not this stuff. It's not even this world, but it's found somewhere else. And so we think about that. That with my actions, I'm, I'm already showing my kids something. I'm already teaching them something about how I live. And I love this quote that Andy had up here um, one week. He said, like, your kids will worship what you worship. And yeah, that's so convicting to me because I think about what is it that I worship? Do I worship my me time? Do I worship my stuff? Do I worship just obtaining things? Because ultimately, that's what I'm showing the, them that's important. 
So that question is, man, do I want to do I want to do I want to point them to worship something, or do I want to point them to worship the one who is supreme over all and sufficient for all? Colossians 2 continues and it says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and in Christ you have been brought to fullness. Meaning there's no one or no one thing that will make you more complete. There's no one or no one thing that will make you more complete, that will give you meaning and purpose and hope. There's nothing that will compare to who Jesus is. He's the fullness of all that. He's the head over every power and authority. In him, you were also circumcised, not with us, with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh, but put off when you were circumcised by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were raised with him through your faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead." He said, listen, it's not about one religious act that will get you closer to God. There's not one religious act that will get you closer to God. Knowing your scriptures, it's a really, really good thing. Getting baptized is a really, really good thing. Coming to church every single week is a really, really good thing. Being plugged into a grow group is a really, really good thing. Giving your money is a really, really good thing. But none of that stuff will save you. None of these religious acts will save you. Even though they are really, really good, the only thing that saves you is trusting in the work that God has completed. Nothing else will save you. Knowing that Jesus died and then was raised from the dead and trusting in that work, that is what saves you. And he continues, When you were dead in your sins, And in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, uh, indebtedness, which stood against us and uh, condemned us. He has taken it all away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them, Uh, by the cross. Without Jesus, we're not just bad people. Without Jesus, we're not just good people who do bad things. Without Jesus, what he's saying is like, you are dead. Without Jesus, you are dead. And what do dead people do? They do nothing. Jesus came and he lived the life that we should have lived and he died the death that we should have died. Jesus didn't come to make good people better. He came to make dead people alive and he forgave us all our sins. Again, Jesus is supreme over all and he's sufficient for all. Go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus. In one commentary I was reading, it talked about how Rome was the greatest governmental power at the time, and Judaism was the greatest religious power at the time, and Jesus, this carpenter, put them all to shame. Not by flexing his deity, not by flexing all that stuff, but giving it all up so that his enemies would be made holy and blameless in the sight of, the God, in sight of God. Jesus put the, the two major powers, governmental and religious, and put them to shame By living a life and giving it up. So Paul urges the Colossians and he urges us to go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus, go back to Jesus. And while today this is all a reminder, today it's all saying go back and go back and remember, remember. There's going to be a day where this is no longer a reminder. There's going to be a day when this is just living. That we get to be with Jesus. That there's a point that it's going to happen where it's going to be eternity and it's going to be with Jesus. Not remembering Jesus, but being with Jesus. It's not going to be a come back to Jesus. It's going to be a with Jesus. Right now I want to invite the worship team and the ushers to come up and we're going to be doing communion And we've been doing communion every week as we've been going through this series uh, to highlight something about uh, the work of Jesus or or who he is and what communion means for us. And today we're going to be looking at um, this idea of beyond to eternity, what Jesus means for that. And what I love about communion is that it brings the past and it brings it right into the present now so that we can look to the future, so that we can look to eternity. Because what happened 2,000 years ago 
We look at that and we say, okay, let's remember what that ha- like what happened. What did Jesus do? Where is he taking us? He, he paid for our sins. We are guiltless. We are sinless now because of that. And so we're going to remember that right now. And as we remember that right now, it points us to eternity. Because of what he did 2,000 years ago, we remember that. And now we have a promise of eternity where there are no more tears. There's no more pain. Those things that we worry about now will be taken care of. All those wrongs will be made right again, again because Jesus is supreme over all creation, over all redemption. And here's the thing. As these plates come around, and if you're, you haven't taken that step of saying like, okay, I'm going to trust in that work of God. If you're just not there yet, that's totally fine. Just let that pl- uh, plate pass by you. But... If you'd like to talk about what that next step is, how do I draw closer to to Jesus? How do I go back to him? We'd love to talk to you about that. So as the elements uh, come around and you take them, just hold on to them and and we'll come back to them in a minute. And I'm going to hand it over to the band right now.